Loving Vincent paints many pictures over the course of its runtime, both figuratively and, well, quite literally. This anime drama based around the life of post-impressionist artist Vincent van Gogh takes place one year after his death, as Armand Roland is tasked by his father, the local postmaster, to deliver Vincent's last letter, and along the way not only learns more about the titular artist's life and struggles, but also that there may be more to his passing than anyone realized. And every step of that journey is hand-painted. Each frame of its 95 minute runtime is an oil painting on canvas, made by one of over 125 different painters from 20 different countries, collectively adding up to approximately 65,000 paintings across a thousand different canvases over four years. It's an impressive achievement, especially since it was originally only planned to be a seven minute short film. According to Dorota Kobiela, the film's co-director, she had been looking for a way to use her skills as a painter and her skills as an animator to make something that could bring the two together, and thought the best subject matter would be to bring the work of a painter to life to tell their story. And while studying Van Gogh's work, she found her inspiration in a quote from one of his letters, We cannot speak other than by her paintings. With the help of Hugh Welkman, a producer known for his work on Peter and the Wolf, she was able to expand it into something much larger. Though, for as daunting as it sounds, the process itself was relatively simple. Production started by filming actors, chosen for their resemblance to the respective historical figures they play, on a soundstage against a green screen, shooting at eight times the pace of a regular film, and adding Van Gogh paintings as backgrounds and editing. Afterward, the footage was projected frame by frame onto a canvas for the animators to paint over. Once done, they would take a picture of the painting with an overhead camera, scrape away what needed to be changed, sometimes the entire canvas, and get to work on the next frame, over and over again for the entire shot. It was a tedious process, but it let them render the celebration of Van Gogh's work in loving detail, and something I think is most obvious in how said work is integrated into the film. Outside of replicating Van Gogh's style, the film uses his paintings for much of its imagery. Sometimes it's used as a background, other times it's referenced with some clever framing, and occasionally is completely recreated with added motion, new lighting, or extra scenery. According to Welkman, they spent one year reimagining his paintings for the medium of film, trying to be as faithful as possible but also adapting them so that they could move. This is also why the film has a 4x3 aspect ratio, as it most closely matches the height and or width of Van Gogh's canvases. It turns the film into a living gallery of his most well-known paintings, one that does its best to honour his work while also adapting it to suit the medium. However, the film has its own tricks to offer, as it occasionally dips into a more photorealistic black and white look. This style is used to differentiate the present in the film and the flashbacks, to dramatise times and situations from from Vincent's story for which there were no painting references, and gives people's eyes a break as they were worried that 94 minutes of intense Vincent style will be too much visually for an audience. And given how it's based on the look of old photographs from the time the film set in, it seemed like a perfect way to give people a snapshot of Vincent's life. It adds some stylistic variety, but also comes with an interesting implication, that the Van Gogh style, with its striking colours, thick brushstrokes and distorted perspectives, is closer to reality than actual realism, which makes sense since the black and white sequences aren't reality their memories. Each a detailed recollection of a character's interactions with Vincent they're trying to piece together into a coherent image. This is emphasised by the way the dialogue of these scenes often sounds disconnected from what's happening, as if it really is just a collection of details. They're not the life of Vincent as it is, but how it's remembered. The Van Gogh style then, being set in the present, is this film's reality. It may not be as realistic, but it's able to capture the emotions of its world and characters more clearly. Which is quite fitting since, according to some interpretations, that's exactly what Van Gogh strove to do with his paintings. Vincent's greatest ambition was to paint modern portraits which would convey the soul of the sitter and hope that people could still look upon these portraits in a hundred years and get a sense of who that person was. And it's with this mentality that the film paints its portrait of Vincent Van Gogh. Now, I can't really comment on the film's historical accuracy, since my knowledge of Van Gogh is limited to general trivia and what I learned in secondary art history, though considering it has the backing and support of the Van Gogh Museum, I think it's safe to say it's at least done a decent job. But I can talk about the impression it gives me of Vincent Van Gogh as he's portrayed in the film. 
Though opinions vary from person to person, it paints Vincent in a sympathetic light. He was a kind man, doing his best to be polite and even making time to draw for the local children when they asked. He was intellectual and artistic, splitting his time between reading fat books, writing long letters, and painting obsessively, weathering literal storms to do so. He could set you watch by him. Painting from 8 until 5, you'd think he was going off to a regular job. He had a passion for life and nature, so much so that when a crow came to eat his lunch one morning by the river, rather than being angry or upset, he seemed more curious than anything else. But at the same time, it makes one wonder. How lonely is this guy? And even a thieving crow brightens up his day. <laughs> as optimistic as Vincent appeared, he also lacked many meaningful connections in life. A problem stretching all the way back to childhood, when his parents, grieving the loss of his stillborn older brother, also named Vincent, gave him little attention, and so when he did develop a connection, even when it was filled with heated arguments, he was desperate to keep it. No, you can't go! No, you can't go! Calm down, Vincent. This left him with an inferiority complex that only fed into the deep mental problems he was plagued by in later life. In many ways, he's the definition of a tortured artist, a trope that portrays a character as being tradely gifted because of their suffering, which, as nice a silver lining as it may sound, is often used to justify an artist doing horrible things to themselves and others in the name of art. And I think the film avoids this problem by emphasizing how Vincent's troubles, rather than driving him, hindered his ability to create. Many characters comment on how they believe he made some of his best work after coming out of hospital. He was calmer. More assured. Take good care. And I thought, this is a man whose story will end well. His star finally rising. The film's portrait of Vincent paints him as a caring, lonely man who was brilliantly not because of his troubles, but in spite of them. However, as mentioned before, we don't learn any of this from Vincent himself. The film is built around the conversations Armand has with the many people around town who knew Vincent. Some with nothing but nice things to say, and others, not so much. We're always skulking about, gobbling our food, just making messes in corners. Oh, well, mustn't keep our lord waiting. As the filmmakers explained, this structure came from the film originally being made up of interviews with an unseen interviewer, as if it was a mockumentary and we weren't satisfied with this approach. They felt like they needed a central character to drive the plot forward, one who could change his view of Vincent the more he found out about him. So it couldn't be someone like Pere Tanguy, who was a loyal friend and passionate supporter of Vincent's work. It needed to be someone who was skeptical, but who could then be won round. This is why Armand was eventually chosen as the protagonist, as not only did the lack of records about him give them some creative freedom with how they characterized him, but he's also someone who had many reasons to be wary of Vincent. Making my family hated when my old man refused to sign that petition. While this approach can be lackluster at times, leaving the film feeling more like a lecture than an actual story, it reflects the way the audience sees Van Gogh, piecing together an understanding of him through whatever information is available after the fact, just as Armand does. It almost feels like trying to solve a mystery, which I guess is what makes the idea of there being more to his death so captivating. The theory that Vincent's death was not his own doing is a controversial one, but the film has no qualms about leaning into it. It explores the differing accounts about where Vincent was shot and the odd details about the angle and depth of his bullet wound. You see, that's too low an angle! <laughs> For what? He would have had to have fired the gun with his outstretched toe! Combined with the knowledge that he hung around with someone who constantly harassed him, who liked to play cowboy with an actual gun, and how Vincent asked no one to be blamed, there's a convincing argument to be made that Vincent's death was actually the result of accidental manslaughter. It certainly convinces Armand, as whilst looking into it, his self-righteous attitude leads to him asking accusatory questions and scolding people for not seeing the obvious. Very friendly of you. Turning your back. Just like with Vincent. Oh, what did you do for him? Huh? I don't hear you telling me that. And that may be Armand's issue. Over the course of these few days, he's gone from wanting nothing to do with Vincent. What did that nobody ever do for us? To understanding and sympathizing with his plight. I know that he tried hard to prove he was good for something. 
He's come to realize how little he really knew about Vincent and how quick he'd been to dismiss him, and may wonder if he could have done something to help had he made the effort. But as Dr. Gachet, Vincent's doctor, explains, for as unlikely as it seems, it's still quite possible that Vincent did decide to take his own life. What's to stop Vincent from doing something improbable? Cutting a piece of your ear off and making a present of it to a whore is hardly probable now, is it? There were many things that sprung up in his last days that could have pushed him over the edge, from Marguerite Gachet thinking her absence may have left him feeling lonelier than ever, or her father believing that during an argument, telling Vincent his brother Theo was in the late stages of syphilis and the stress of supporting him could make it worse had broke him. Or the explanation could be even simpler than that. You're familiar with can change from feeling life is a wondrous joy to being stuck in a pit of despair within six hours. So, I think what changes are possible within six weeks. Maybe his melancholy made him do it. Maybe he felt he'd become too much of a burden for his brother to bear. Maybe his loneliness finally got to him. Maybe it was none of these things, or maybe it was all of them and more just getting to be too much to cope with. And at the end of the day, figuring out whether or not he shot himself doesn't change the fact that he still let himself bleed to death. It's hard to accept, especially since everyone agrees that Vincent seemed happy, but by his own written words, even his better days still felt like weeks. It's easy to make assumptions about people based only on tangible things like their behavior, their relationships, and so on, but doing so lets the harder to grasp details like their thoughts and how they feel about generally and in the moment slip right through the cracks. An issue that's only made more complicated when mental illness is involved, which is often misunderstood, hard to recognize, and hidden by those suffering from it. Hell, I can tell you from personal experience how surprised people are when you do tell them about it. There are people I've known my whole life who were absolutely shocked to hear about what I dealt with. They just never realized or never would have guessed and who, even after I've explained it, are not very good at copying it. Not trying to call them out or anything, it's just to emphasize that even when we think we know someone, we often don't have the full picture of what they're dealing with. It's a whole other world up there. Something we get to gaze upon, but don't fully understand. Reminds me of him. And I think that's the point. We really do speak only through our paintings, including the metaphorical ones we create to understand the world and, more importantly, the people around us. But painting in as many details of a person as can fit in our portraits doesn't make them any more accurate. All we can do is hope we're able to capture the essence of who they are and what they're going through as earnestly as we can. And yeah, those are my thoughts. I will admit, I was a bit wary of making this one just because of the whole historical accuracy factor, but I just have such an appreciation for loving Vincent that I had to ramble about it. So I hope my thoughts on the film itself are enough. Plus, it gave me a good excuse to try something new with my editing and presentation and stuff, which is always fun. And let me finally try out a new sorta structure for my videos, though I don't think it's very noticeable. <laughs> I've talked about this before, but I've been looking for a way to give my videos a repeatable format so I don't have to feel like I'm starting from complete scratch every time I try to make one, but one that still gives me a lot of wiggle room both in what I discuss and how I make the video. And I have to say, I think it worked out pretty well here, though I think the next few videos are gonna really put it to the test in that regard. If you did notice, feel free to tell me how well or how poorly you think I handle it. Anyway, let me know what you think. If you agree, disagree, why you think of loving Vincent, if there are any unique forms of animation you're a big fan of, etc. And thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this and want to see more, then check out my last video, where I ramble about my top things of summer 2019. Or check out my video on the way the MCU's developed over the years, and the influence it's had on our modern media landscape. And don't forget to like, comment, share, and of course, subscribe to come fly with me. Hit the bell to stay notified, follow me on Twitter for more updates, ramblings, and poor attempts at humor, and hopefully, I'll see you later.